Good morning. morning. It is good to see you this morning. Uh, One thing I know that I've been pushed by Don. Don wants me to let you know that it's important to sign up for the... uh, Don, here you go. Come on up. You don't have to run. I see you got your... That's what I want you to talk about. Don, Don said, George, is it a rhetorical question when you say, are there any other announcements for the good of the whole? And I say, no, it's not a rhetorical question. It is a real thing. Come on up to the microphone. Well, but people online. we will get the people online. Maybe they'll come to church and help us. This is not encouraging people to want to speak at this time. It gets kind of intense. Rise Against Hunger. If you are not yet signed up, the time is now. It is September 7th, 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock. We're going to package bags of food. We're going to package enough food to feed 20,000 people. Actually, I think it's 20,088, but who's counting? Um, And we need you. So please, 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 if you are tech savvy, there are QR codes posted on the flyers, and you just scan the code and sign up. If you'd rather I do it for you, and I'm happy to do so, then all you have to do is sign up on these clipboards out there in the Welcome Center, and I'll take care of that part. Thank Amen. you. Thank Amen. you. Give her a round of applause for that. She deserves it. <laughs> Rise Against Hunger is on the back of your bulletin. There's some important announcements of upcoming events. The Lunch Bunch uh, on August 18th has passed, so I don't know how that's still there. They went and they had fun, so look for the next lunch bunch, and maybe you can go and have fun too. Amen? Third Sunday of September. Third, sum- third Sunday of September. Uh, there's also going to be a seminar uh, here, Loving Someone with Addiction, a family seminar. That's going to be put out uh, by an outside group. So uh, mental health is really important. Um, we need to care for each other and make sure that we stay uh, in, in mind, body, and spirit centered in God. Amen? Are there any other announcements for the good of the whole? Whether you're worshiping online or you're here in person, we give thanks that you're here with us today worshiping. Uh, May the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you. Let us worship God. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul soul longs and indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. Lord. My My heart and my flesh sing for for joy to the the living God. God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy Happy are are those who who live in your house, house, ever singing your praise. praise. Let Let us worship the Lord our God.
the Lord redeems the life of his servants, none of those who take refuge in God will be condemned. Friends in Christ, trusting in God is always trusting that God is always more ready to forgive than we are to confess. Let us turn to God in prayer, seeking forgiveness and new life. Loving God, through Christ you abide in us, and you invite us to abide in you. But so often we are restless and unsatisfied. Instead of resting in the fullness of life Christ offers to us, we chase after money, fame, recognition, power, status, and control. Instead of honoring the image of God in all our neighbors, we push others down in the pursuit of our own desires. Forgive us for forgetting that you call us to a different way of being in the world, to live in the self-giving love of Christ. Lead us out of self-interest and into communal care for one another and the world you have made. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, indeed, our confession is not only personal but communal. It is a part of all that God came to redeem. For God so loved the world that he sent his, un, his only son into the world, not to condemn it, but that the whole world might be saved through him. Friends, with such a strong advocate at God's right hand, I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. As a people forgiven and restored, we are free to greet each other with signs of Christ's peace. The peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you. Let's take this time to pass the peace amongst each other. Christ's peace, my brother. Good to see you. Peace be with you. Christ peace be with you. Christ peace. Christ peace be with you. Christ peace. Christ peace be with you. Christ peace. Peace in the back row. Christ peace. Christ peace in the back row. Good to see you. Yes, Mac. Peace be with you. God, 
quiet our hearts and our minds amid the clattering chaos of the world and all voices vying for our attention. May we clearly hear your word of life spoken to us today. As we hear, help us to understand. As we understand, move us to respond in love. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Psalms. I'll be reading Psalms chapter 8, verses, sorry, chapter 84, verses 5 through 12. I invite you to follow along with me using the words printed in your bulletins. Let us listen for God's word to us this morning. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. God's word for the people of God. Our second reading today comes to us from the book of Ephesians. I brought along my friend. We don't have any children here today. It's the end of summer and all the kids are off on vacation. But I brought a friend. How many of y'all know this person from vacation Bible school long past? I don't know if Greg can get that on camera. I should sit him here by Betsy. <laughs> but I won't. I'm gonna, I hope this is, might be off camera, but y'all will be able to see it. Y'all have seen it already. So you know what text I'm going to be reading. Uh, I'm going to be reading first from the NRSV, and then I'm going to be reading from the message. Uh, Peterson's translation of the Bible, I think, gets sometimes to the core of the message, not to be punny, but uh, sometimes we get lost in the words and in especially with this text, people get caught up in the metaphor and they're worried about the belt and the sword and the shield and the helmet and, the, and they stop listening to the message and they're all focused on the wrong, they got the emphasis on the wrong syllable, right? <laughs> Listen to the words that Paul's really trying to share with us. Faith, peace, those other words that stand out about who we're called to be as children of God. So Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, first through the NRSV and then through the message. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything to stand firm. Stand, therefore. And fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breath, breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all these things, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. 
and now the message translation. And that about wraps it up. God is strong and he wants you to be strong. So take everything that the master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use so you'll be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. This is no weekend war that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps, a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and his angels. Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get. Every weapon that God has issued so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll be standing on your feet. Truth. Righteousness. Peace. Faith. And salvation are more than words. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word, God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in the ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. And don't forget to pray for me. Pray that I'll know what to say and have the courage to say it at the right time. Telling the mystery to the one and all the message that I, a jailbird preacher that I am, am responsible for getting out. This is God's word for God's people. So what's happening in this letter to the Ephesians? The writer of this letter to the church in Ephesus uh, is talking about a very different way of life from the pagan life that they had been living before. He warns against taking up arms of, uh, against the enemies of flesh and blood. This is not a physical warfare where we actually take a sword and chop people's ears off. We know how Jesus doesn't like that. Amen? So in the first century in Asia Minor in Ephesus, we have to remember that the Christians, this new uh, group of people who are following Christ, were religious minorities in uh, in the world. Christianity was not legal until 313 AD. We talk sometimes, you'll hear people say that Christianity is being persecuted in these United States of America. Friends, I'd love to share with you if you disagree with me, but we are not being persecuted. Uh, we live in a very privileged place in the world. Back then, they would have you executed for being a Christian. That's persecution. They could drag you to the temple and make you worship the Roman emperor, Domitian. They had a brand new temple built. They could drag you off to that temple and make you worship the Roman emperor. That's persecution. It was in the commercial center of the goddess Artemis uh, where you have this heavy influence of the Roman pantheon and people would be taken to those temples and tested. That's persecution. We're facing challenges, but we need to be honest about what those challenges are. I don't think that the challenges are external. I think that the challenges are for us to live our faith. Uh, what does it mean to take on that belt of truth? What does it mean to proclaim the good news of the gospel? What does it mean to, uh, to take on the powers and principalities of this world in honest ways out of our faith? And I think that sometimes we can come to very different conclusions about what that looks like, what that means. But the struggle is real nonetheless. Throughout this letter to the Ephesians, they are reminded that they are risen up with Christ, right? This image of uh, being persecuted and yet 
simultaneously being risen with Christ, they're transformed into a new way of being. They are to put on this new godly self in righteousness and holiness. They're to be strong in the Lord, in His strength and His power. And remember what I said, it wasn't until 313 that Christianity became the official religion. And so what did we do, and I say we, I'm talking about our ancestors in faith, the mothers and church fathers of history, what did we do? Well, 12 years later in 325, in, as they were in the Nicene and Chalcedon uh, assemblies, they started persecuting each other claiming that each other were tools of the devil because they didn't have the right understanding of who Christ was. And the Orthodox persecuted the heretics, and the heretics were anybody who weren't Orthodox. And by 431, in, and we're back at this time uh, in Ephesus, the Third Ecumenical Council, the Nestorians and others confronted each other and called each other tools of the devil over the differences in understanding the nature of Christ. And we have been warring against the heretics ever since. Amen? All right, now I'm going to get to preaching a little bit, hopefully. So as I was thinking about putting on the armor of faith, I, I brought with me my armor of faith when I'm getting ready to go into battle, you know? This is my, this is my belt of righteousness. When we put on these, these uniforms... We have a physical representation of what it is we're getting ready to do. And I'm putting this on so that if any of y'all want to fight me, you know what you got to deal with. <laughs> and my jacket of righteousness. Back, back when I competed, this thing actually closed really well. <laughs> when I put this on, you say, well, George either went to the sh shop and bought himself a black belt or he knows something. Amen. This, this, this says something about me, right? This says, ready for battle. Do I look like I'm ready for battle? Yeah. You scared? Yeah. Don't, be, don't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> Judo is the gentle way. But, you know, we wear our uniforms, and our uniforms say something about who we are, right? As a pastor, I, I hope you didn't think this was like the left behind situation where we had a pastor here, he got sucked up into heaven. <laughs> I just threw it over here to be warm. The, the robe we wear is a symbol of our office, which says, you know, this isn't about me. This isn't about George Tatro. This is about proclaiming the word of God and this robe symbolizes that, that it's the office, not the person. And I try to be, I try to live into this, I try to fit into it, kind of like I try to fit in my old gi. Gi is the name of a uniform. And this stole is not a weapon of Christ, it represents the yoke of Christ. God's word is a yoke that pastors take on so that when they preach, uh, they have Taken on Christ's yoke. Take my yoke upon you. My burden is light. It's a burden, but it's a light burden. And I hope that in my proclamation of the word and as we explore these texts together and as we seek to live into this calling to do those things that, that the writer of the letter of uh, the Ephesians, uh, and I think that there's some question, I think that that's why they refer to it that way instead of saying Paul. Uh, Paul may not have written it. It might have been one of Paul's disciples. But as we think about these things, what are the things that are lifted up? One of the things that keeps coming up time and time again is stand firm. Stand, I think that's said five or six times in this passage. Stand your ground. Not, it's not about aggression or um, passivity. It's about standing firm in your faith, right? Righteousness, truth, peace, faith. These are the things that Paul is, lift, well, whoever wrote Ephesians, but I, I say Paul, that Paul writes about. It's not important this. I'm, I'm going to put this, follow me, Greg, I'm moving around. 
It's not about that. I'm not going to battle over with the Nestorians or with anybody else who's a heretic. I'm going to stand firm in my faith, and I'm going to engage with others uh, and do my best to be in relationship with them as a child of God and seeing them as a child of God. It's not always easy. Sometimes it breaks down. Sometimes those things break down. But, but what Paul is calling us to is this, this new way of being in the world as Christians. And it carries over from the first century till today. Amen? We have, we have people of good faith who are, are vehemently uh, at odds with each other about what Scripture says. And sometimes people say you're unorthodox. I, will share with, I want to share with you two stories about this. When I was at Memorial Drive, it was, it was great fun. I, I got a letter from, I think he was the bishop of uh, Armenia or something. And I did some research on it, and I found out that he had not only excommunicated the pope, but he'd also excommunicated the Eastern Orthodox potentate or whoever the, is in charge of that Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, and he sent me a letter excommunicating me from the church. Uh, it was an email. And he said that because of the stance of the PCUSA, we were heretics and we were excommunicated. And I love that. I love being excommunicated by this guy who I'd never even heard of who lived over in Armenia somewhere. And so I sent an email immediately back, and I said, I do not accept your excommunication unless it comes on formal letterhead from your church, because I wanted to have that thing framed and hung in my office. Uh, so that was, one, <laughs> that was one, one of the times that, you know, we have a flavor of what it is like. A another time, I got a... Um, I got a mass email blitz that, has, that went out from Robert Schuller Jr. How many of y'all remember the Crystal Cathedral growing up? Robert Schuller? Yeah. Well, y'all are from California. Y'all remember that. Uh, uh, yeah, right? It was a great it had the hour of power. He had the hour of power on television. You could watch the hour of power. And I remember as a kid watching that <coughs> over other things. Uh, anyways, there's a lot of fallout that happened in the family as Robert Schuller Sr. died, and his son uh, took over for a little while, and then his sister took over, and they eventually got sold to the Catholic Church. It's a Catholic uh, cathedral now. Um, but Robert Schuller sent me this uh, email with a bunch of things that were very concerning to him uh, that were happening in the, these United States of America, and telling me that the devil was winning and that the devil was going to take over the world, uh, and that, you know, I needed to stand firm and, by the way, send money, right? <laughs> and I will tell you, in this, in this political season, if you don't get a reply to me and you text me, it's because I'm getting 25 and 30 texts a day. How many of y'all are dealing with this? It's driving me nuts. And that people are telling me about the evils of this world and how they're going to fix it. I don't know what to say. It drives me nuts. Anyways, I got this letter from Robert Schuller Jr. about all the evils that are happening in the world. And I wrote him back, and I said, you know, these are not the evils that I'm dealing with right now at Memorial Drive Presbyterian Church. I'm in the most diverse neighborhood in this country. We've got extreme poverty in this neighborhood. I've got an apartment complex behind uh, the church, if you, if you Google worst neighborhood in America, uh, you do this, I'm telling you, worst neighborhood in America, there's a video uh, about Brandon Hills where there were regular shootings, where once a month it seemed like a building would burn to the ground, where refugees were being taken advantage of by absentee landlords and charged thousands of dollars for, to live in squalor, where the county of DeKalb County, and, I, and we worked with them for 10 years while I was there, was always going to fix up Brandon Hills, and you know what? Brandon Hills is not fixed up today. It's still a mess. And yet in the midst of that mess, 
ministry is happening still on that campus of Memorial Drive Presbyterian Church, even though the church isn't there, all of the ministries we started continue because we formed a nonprofit to ensure that the people of that neighborhood were continued to be served even after the church was gone. Okay? It's a powerful witness against the powers and principalities of this world. Against, against government that doesn't work, against systems that allow people to be taken advantage of, against the horrors of crime, trafficking of people, trafficking of drugs. And the church stood against that. So that's what I sent off to him. I said, if you want, if you want buddy, if you want to see real problems, you come on down here. Right? Didn't think another thing of it. Two months later, I got an email from Robert Schuller. I'm going to be in Atlanta. I'll come see you. And he came, and I showed him around. Uh, I was amazed, to be honest with you, because that was so completely foreign to every experience he had as a pastor in the Crystal Cathedral. Can you imagine? He didn't understand what he was looking at. But he came and he saw. And I took him down to this restaurant that has the best fried chicken in Atlanta. The only problem is they only fry legs. It's a Muslim restaurant in uh, on Memorial Drive, they only do chicken legs. And while I was there, we saw the Methodist pastor from down the street, and so I was able to introduce him to the Methodist pastor because, you know, pastors know the best place to eat. And if it's the place where all the taxi cab drivers in there go, you know that's a good place to eat, and it's cheap, which is another thing Presbyterian pastors like, cheap, good food. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, you know what? He said, I never refuse an invitation. What God has called me to do is whenever I get an invitation from somebody to do something, I go and I see what's happening. Because I don't have uh, a lock on Jesus. I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything. Um, and so, to me, it was very interesting because what was clearly an effort to raise funds for this project that he had going on was able to be transformed into a relationship where we learned a little bit about each other, you know? And he invited me to a gathering of conservative evangelicals. Uh, one of the, Neil Bush was there, uh, uh, George Bush's brother, Thousand Points of Light. This is a place that I never would have thought I would have found myself. But because he was, because he accepted my hospitality, he extended hospitality to me, I extended, I received that hospitality. I, I don't know that we changed uh, our minds about some fundamental things. I think that we still probably are very different ideas about our faith and, and what it means to be a Christian, what it means to live out our faith, uh, and the struggles we have in all of it. You know, I'm not perfect either. Um, but what was, to me, eye-opening was, or at least refreshing or life-giving, was the fact that even though we come from these two different places and two different life experiences and two different ministries, we found a common ground on which to stand. A common ground. Our faith, our love of Jesus Christ. Our hope for a better tomorrow. And it, it, it's a blessing to me, I, I say this often, there are some people who you meet in life, you're just glad to know they're out there in the world being them. I don't have to be Robert Schuller Jr., he's out there being him. I can be George, and I don't have to know everything he's doing. I'm just happy he's out there doing it. Because for the most part, I think he really is a person of faith 
who's trying to find his way in life through the challenges of this world, through the challenges of the powers and principalities that are aligned against us, to live faithfully and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. So when I hear people say that we're being persecuted and want to slap the Ten Commandments up on some building, I can't help but wonder why nobody ever says we're being persecuted and they want to slap up the Beatitudes on a building. Because Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are you when people persecute you and harass you and say ill things about you for my name's sake. Blessed are the peacemakers. very different message than the Ten Commandments gives us. I mean, Ten Commandments are a good set of rules for living by. It makes sure that everybody respects each other's boundaries. But, but the Beatitudes call us to a different way of being. To put our faith and trust in God into action. To love the least among us. To love the marginalized, the outcast, the outsider, the foreigner, the alien in our land. So friends in Christ, as you go about your day, this, like Eugene Peterson says, this is not a battle for one day and then it's over. This is, this is a lifelong battle. As you go about your life, stand firm in the Lord and put whatever shoes you need to put on to proclaim that good news to the world. Whatever shoes you need to strap on, to go out into the world and proclaim Jesus Christ in, in word and in deed. Stand firm in your faith. Righteousness, truth, and peace be with you. Amen.
put them down, hands together. I went to the doctor and got an endoscopy. And before he did that, they tested my blood pressure. And I know we Presbyterians like to keep our blood pressure down. <laughs> but I want to commend to you our psalm, where it talks about, happy are those who live in your house ever singing your praise. Let us worship the Lord our God. Amen? Amen. So I just commend you to the Psalms, because we got another one where I'm going to break out the tambourine at the end. It's okay to get your blood pressure up a little bit. Amen? Amen. All right, good. Uh, having said that, wait. That's why my judo training is good. I learned how not to fall. Having, having said that, and with, uh, with a cheerful heart and joyous song on our heart, let us confess, uh, confess what we believe. I believe in God, the Father, God, make, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, when, when Christ abides in us and we abide in him, we can see that everything we have been given is a gift from God, the gift of time, talent, and treasure God has entrusted us with are not to be hoarded, but to be shared, to give life to others as Christ gives life to us. Let us now return a portion of what God has generously given to us for the building of God's kingdom here on earth.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the privilege of building your house here on earth. We pray that all that we say and all that we do is a foretaste of that heavenly kingdom. Help us to show forth our love for you in our service to each other and our service to the world around us. Multiply all of our gifts. Help us to use them beyond our wildest imagination to bring about your kingdom and your plans and purposes for this world. This we pray in Christ's powerful name. Amen. There's a prayer. Please be seated. There's a prayer of dedication I put in the bulletin today, but I didn't use it, so I commend that to you, and you can read it at your own leisure. Uh, I'm always forgetting something, and I always think it's the Holy Spirit, so if you would, please make sure to let us know you were with us today and sign those friendship registers and pass them on down. Uh, You'll make my life a lot easier on Monday if you do that on Sunday, because on Monday, if, if, if Linda doesn't get them, I'm the one who gets in trouble, so... It's a service to me. We pray for each other, for the church, and for the world around us, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. For Dottie and for Sarah and for Reed, Lord, in your mercy. Chris. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Chris. Lord, in your mercy. For Palestine and Israel, people of Ukraine and Russia, Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, we have lifted up the names of those people who are on our hearts. And we know that the prayers that we cannot put words to, your Holy Spirit seeks them out and prays them on our behalf. And so we lift up those whom we've named and those who our lips tremble to name, trusting in your love and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, in this season of this nation, we pray that your Holy Spirit will bring wisdom and wise decisions to those people seeking office. We ask for your guidance as we make important decisions about whom we are voting for, that your Spirit will guide us in our decision-making. We pray for people who agree with us and for the people who disagree with us, knowing that the only true kingdom is your kingdom, that whatever divisions we might want to create between ourselves and others, even though they may mimic what happened in 312, that those differences be swept away by the fact that we are all your children, called to love one another, to seek peace and reconciliation with one another. Help us to find those places of commonality and to set aside our differences, to truly love one another. Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be with the leaders of Israel and Palestine. We pray for peace in the homeland. We pray for all those who are suffering against the powers and principalities of this world that bring about 
division and destruction, poverty, enslavement. And we ask that your liberating spirit be sweeping over this world right now so that every human being might flourish as you're created. Lord, we pray for the mission of Johns Creek. We may not have power to transform the world, but we have the power to transform our community. So we ask your Holy Spirit be with us in these days. Open our hearts and minds and eyes to see where you're calling us and give us the courage to stand in our faith serving our brothers and sisters. We pray all this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. one more time. I don't even care if you get the words right. Put your things down. I'm sending you out in song with a joyful spirit. Put your bulletins down. We've st Come on, Reed. Help me out. <laughs> Hallelujah. We sing your praises. I want, I, Robbie's not here today. I don't have an amen corner. Let's burst this out. We're getting ready to go out and face the powers and principalities of this world, people. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? amen. I know I'm Presbyterian. But my mom was Baptist. What can I say? <laughs> and this song's from someplace else, too. So let's, let's do that one more time. With, with, I want to see lips moving, even if you don't say anything. All right? Let's go. <laughs> Hallelujah. We sing your praises. All our hearts are filled with gladness. Hallelujah. We sing your praises. All our hearts are 
to get a tambourine, and you're going to get a tambourine. I'm going to stick tambourines under all the benches. It's going to be like the Oprah show. That is such a great hymn to close on. It is a great hymn. I love it, not just because I get to play the tambourine. We got a new drum. We're going to get a drummer in here. Does anybody know how to play the drum? Raise your hand. All right, Blunt, you're up. (laughs) Friends, the song says it all. Everything you need to know. Now, He sends us all out, strong in faith, free of doubt. Strong in faith, free of doubt. Tell to all the joyful gospel. That right there, my friend, is all you need to know to go out into this world where the powers and principalities, all of the isms that bring people down, racism, capitalism, communism, fascism, all of these belief systems that are not about Jesus Christ, that people put their faith into, that wage war against God's message of love and inclusivity, that wage war against God's love of each and every one of us. And I don't care what ism it is. It's a belief system that doesn't rely on Jesus Christ and God's word made flesh, that powerful, powerful word that transforms lives and gives life eternal. You with me? Those are the powers and principalities. Stand firm in your, in your shoes, whatever help you proclaim that gospel of good news, that you are a beloved child of God, Amen? Amen. That's your charge. So go out into that world. And don't be afraid of the powers and principalities. Because in Jesus Christ, you are set free and equipped to do battle with them all. May the blessing of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest on each and every one of you this day and all the days to come. Amen? Amen. Peace. Thanks. Good job.